My project is on reaction time with your dominant and non-dominant hand. What I did was I um, put a ruler up to someone's hand like this, and I dropped it, and they tried to catch it as quick as they could, and the least amount of centimeters that they showed on the ruler next to their thumb, that's the better reaction time that they had. And I did mine about solar power and circuits, which is a series circuit and a parallel circuit. If you would come over here, it shows uh, the first light solar panel and it's radio so if you shine light on it like this it will start up over here i don't know why it's not but yeah <laughs> and here we have the wire clips right here and this is a parallel circuit and then there's one over here this one's the series circuit and it will tell how much more energy uh, this one has than the parallel circuit which is the series circuit and the parallel and that's about it okay thank you James Langworthy and my project is called shaping your thoughts my project is about after reading slips of paper with correct information matched with the shapes and then see is reading slips of paper with incorrect information matched with shapes. If your mind gets confused and you start stumbling it takes you almost twice as long to read the shape. And my science fair project is on uh, memory distractions and multitasking. I've got my Simon 2, which is a memory game. I have a video with music playing on my laptop and music to listen to on my phone. And as, as you get to the next group, in a sense, the uh, more distractions will come. Like, you'll start off with no distractions, then you'll start off with a ringtone from my phone, then you'll um, be doing ringtone and a video on my laptop. And, that, and then the uh, results for the people that I tested show that um, uh, some people are affected more by distractions than other people, and some people aren't affected by distractions at all. My name is Mike. I did a project on uh, the effect oil spills have on uh, wildlife animals. And what did you? Uh, I found out that once the oil is added, uh, the duck kind of stays stationary and it, it limits an animal's uh, motion. Uh, for birds, it mostly gives them hypothermia because they can't preen their feathers or fan them out or anything. So they get too cold and they're not able to keep any warmth in at all and they freeze to death. For dolphins, it gets into their uh, dolphins, whales, any air breathing mammal that lives under the water as well as fish. Uh, since they have to come up to the surface, they have to come through all the oil. It gives them skin irritation, gets into their blood and leads to killing them. And uh, I did a test on depth perception. I wanted to figure out what the, um, how depth perception affects the two human eyes. And uh, for my test, I used a cup, a couple of pennies, and a target. And I had a test subject sit in front of a table, two feet out from the cup. And then um, I would have... I would stand out in front of them and ask them to tell me and cover one eye and then tell me which when to drop the penny into the cup and see how many out of five they got with their right eye and then I would test their left eye and I found out that with their dominant eye they, they would usually get around four percent in or four out of five in and with their uh, non-dominant eye they would get three out of five so that affects when you're looking at something to see where it actually is and then I did another test on um, with, with the target and I had them stand 10 feet out and um, I would move around and, have, and they would tell me which direction to go in where I would be directly over the bullseye and the target and then I would drop a marker and then I found out that, um, that usually around two with, the, with their dominant eye would go in the bullseye and then usually around um, three would go outside and then with their non-dominant eye, it would be all outside, there would be no bullseyes. Uh, so, with depth perception, it all um, with both eyes, it's going to be perfect, but with your non-dominant eye, it's not, it's going to be different. Well, I, I tested um, what 
acrostic with what hold throws farther. And um, not many people know this, but hold is um, how the how much the ball can stay in the stick. So like if you uh, like tilt it at about an 80 degree angle, will it fall out? If it does, it's called low hold. That's what I have here, low hold. And then if it doesn't, it's called high hold. So that would be right here. And high hold is usually harder to throw with because it doesn't come out of stick as easily. So with a, I tested um, a, a long stick with high hold and low hold. And I tested a short stick with higher low hold. And I tested um, which one would throw farther. And I found out that the short stick actually, the short stick with low hold would be farther by, a, by about seven feet from um, the long stick of the world. and I thought the long stick was gonna go farther because it was it was a lot bigger and it would have gotten more momentum but I was proved wrong when I tested it because um, I, I guess that um, the short stick you can have a lot more power because you have it's clear the the um, you call the head is uh, closer to your hand so it can get a lot going a lot faster and I guess that just helps you the most instead of like it being a lot uh, like just up there and throw it, so I guess um, I was proved wrong on that one. So yeah, and, uh, I went up to I went to an a uh, flat field for this project, and it was a pretty big field because I did throw pretty far. But uh, so, yeah, I, I used a cross stick, a ball. A, uh, one of the, a couple, one of the biggest factor was a, a hold, the hold, which was basically the whole project, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I tested. And I was like, uh, can fear be, can, will be affected by fear? So um, I'd have somebody sit down and I'd show them, I'd show them like a, I'd show them like a scary video. First I would, um, first I would test their heart rate to see how they are standing first. Then I would show their, um, then I'd show them the video. Then I would test their heart rate after. <laughs> Well, then I have a couple reactions of some of the people. And then these are these are how how much their um, heart rate went up. And my project was um, to see how um, or if music had an effect on the heart rate of someone. So what I did was I um, let someone, I took their resting heart rate, um, I multiplied that by three, and then I let them choose between classic rock, heavy metal, and or rap. And um, if they chose whatever music they chose, I let them listen to that song for three minutes. Then I took their pulse after the song, multiplied that by three, and then that's how I found their resting heart rate, or after the song, after the song heart rate. And then I I would do another person, and then I'd come back to that person, and I would. Um, and then I would test them on like a uh, symphony because it's like a lighter, calmer music. And then I took their resting heart rate again, multiply that by three, and then I let them listen to the symphony song for three minutes. And I let them, and then they, uh, they, and then I took their heart rate again to see if it went down or up. And then I averaged all the per and then I did the percent change. And the average percent, uh, the average resting heart rate was 71 beats per minute, and the uh, average increase was 21 percent. Um, heavy metal music, the people I tested, their um, heart rate was between um, 96, one was 96, 86, and 81, which was more than everybody else's. So.
Yo, uh, I did a project on the Titanic's split head, and um, as you can see, I have my little station set, set up. I have the Titanic sinking, and I also have a chart of the bulkheads positions, which is one of the reasons why it's split. But um, yeah, I uh, used this program to um, kind of calculate the split angle. I put a pressure and uh, weight script into it, and it splits eventually. Um, it's a very slow computer. I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to calculate the split angle. And I did uh, my project was is called Remember That Smell, and it's on if. Uh, smells uh, can create or uh, bring back memories uh, from like your past, and uh, I figured out that smell it uh, goes through the olfactory system to get to your brain, and it's the most uh, directly linked to the brain. It's not; it doesn't have to go through all the filters that taste and hearing and touch do to get to your brain. And uh, I tested ten cents uh, cologne bottle. Uh, uh, an, uh, incense, like they burn at church, except I didn't burn it, it still gives off a scent. And uh, a peppermint scent, a lavender scent, a lemon scent, a sweet marjoram scent, uh, Vicks, uh, a vapor rub, which clears up, it has a really strong scent. And then this is red mandarin, and I also use garlic. And, uh, I tested 15 people, and out of them, uh, the average was they got 26% uh, right. And to get it right, I I had them smell all the scents. Then I went back through in a different order, and they said the same. And uh, they had to say the first thing that came to their mind when they smelled it. And if they said the same thing twice, then they would get it right. And so the average was 26% right. And yeah, but only uh, six people out of the 15 got more than uh, four out of the 10 right. So I thought that was pretty cool. And because uh, it was surprising, I thought there would be a lot more. Because my hypothesis was that uh, it would it would be most of the way it would most people would it would trigger the smells of most people. So yeah, I so I I said that it is less than half of most of the time. The, it's uh, it's less than half of the sense. Uh, I discovered that cell phones do not hurt you, and I discovered that it actually doesn't has no effect on you, and you don't have to be worried at night that you're gonna throw a brain brain tumor in your head. Um, I put 10 milliliters of water in a cup, and then put a phone under it and let it ring for two minutes straight. I kept on calling it, and it didn't have any effect on the water, which means it actually got colder from just sitting down. It didn't have any effect, so it just showed. And my project for this year's science fair was uh, which sense is better in the identification of foods? Taste, smell, or touch? Um, I test this by taking five different foods, which are listed on the materials over there, which are jelly beans, marshmallows, tomato sauce, pudding, and frosting. And I had each person like, taste, touch, or smell them, whatever sense I assigned them. And they had five seconds to tell me what food that was, um, and then I recorded the number of they got, the number of foods they got correct, their scents they used, and their average time. And the average time you want to be the lowest because that's how you identify the food. And um, I, my hypothesis said that uh, the sense of taste would be more accurate, and that's what I proved. Um, I found out that uh, dominant hands and non-dominant hands are based on what you did when you grew up. So a lot of people um, are ambidextrous because they grew up using both hands, and a lot of people, their their hands like that they are good with, grew up when uh, their parents were trying to get them to be lefty or righty. So especially for baseball, like pitchers. And uh, so what my experiment was basically about was, because I'm kind of ambidextrous in a lot of things, so that's why I kind of wanted to do this, 
and uh, so I found it uh, um, kind of interesting. So, um, my hypothesis was that most people would always pick up everything with their dominant hand, and so when I asked them to pick up and hold the book and then drink the next cup, they'd either switch the book over or just pick it up with their non-dominant hand. So, I found out that it was like, they wanted to use their dominant hand for everything. And my, conclu my conclusion was that my hypothesis was two-thirds right, and I only got one thing wrong, and it was that people switched over the book. So, that's basically what my whole project was about.